You are listening to Something Rather Than Nothing. Creator and host, Ken Vellante. Editor and producer, Peter Bauer. This is Ken Vellante with Something Rather Than Nothing. And today it's uh, towards the end of the month of February 2021. And... um, uh, I'm thinking baseball, and I know some of the some of uh, my listeners are thinking baseball as well. And uh, uh, I'm pleased this episode to have Greg Larson, who uh, wrote um, a book that's actually going to be released uh, pretty darn soon, around the time of uh, first pitch, uh, April 1st, called Clubby, uh, a memoir of the minor leagues. Uh, Greg Larson, uh, author, uh, baseball lover, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Ken. Yeah, so um, I, uh, I I mentioned to you I, I really uh, enjoyed your book, and I and I think that there's something about uh, baseball that uh, you know people connect to uh, uh, culturally. And um, uh, done a couple of baseball episodes, one with uh, Rachel Balkovic, uh, hidden instructor instructor for the Yankees, and uh, uh, Brad Belukshin, who did a fantastic book, uh, a Wax Pack. And uh, so we're back at um, uh, baseball and, and writing. But prior to get into your memoir and your uh, exploration and experience mm-hmm. in baseball, w- why don't you tell me about when you were younger and, you know, what was important to you in sports or writing, anything like that? Yeah, when I was younger, I'm the youngest of five boys. So my family role was the comic relief, the mascot. I would memorize episodes of The Simpsons and my brother would just tell me like if there was a lull in the conversation, he would say, hey, do the lemon tree episode. And I would just launch (laughs) off into the dialogue of the episode and explaining the scenes. That was the sort of storytelling that I was obsessed with was comic books and comedy. I was obsessed with Conan O'Brien. I was an outdoors kid. I would go out. You know, I grew up in rural Minnesota. And so I would go biking around the lake, water skiing. I was, I was a very quiet, very shy, cerebral kid. And I would, my, my early writing was really writing jokes like that. That was my obsession. I do stand up comedy now as an amateur. And I, I, that was the beginning of my love of writing was my joke book. I, uh, and, and thanks for sharing that. Hey, just out of curiosity, if, mm-hmm. if I can just jump right in on the, I had read that you've done some, some comedy work. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I love, I love stand up comedy. What, what, just out of curiosity, mm-hmm. what, you know, with the pandemic and everything, uh, right now, and I know there's been a lot of online things. I mean, what, uh, how does a, how does a comedian get through the pandemic? Yeah, the Zoom shows, it's such a comedy. It, you need an audience in order for comedy to be comedy. More so, yeah. writing a book has not changed with the pandemic, uh, but comedy is completely transformed. At first, last summer, I was doing a lot of Zoom shows, and it felt a little bit... I, I felt like a crazy person doing these Zoom shows, just like telling jokes to my screen Everyone has themselves muted. There's like five other people on the on the um, pod on the Zoom comedy club. It's just I, I moved back to Texas, and Texas is quite a bit more open than a lot of other states. And I've been doing socially distanced, wearing a mask. I've been doing open mics here up until I started the book marketing process, and um, I was going up maybe five times a week. I don't know how reckless that is or what. I did catch COVID. <laughs> right. I right. got COVID um, a couple of weeks ago. I was sick for a couple of days and I'm back now. And um, I haven't been, I, I don't plan on going to do stand up anytime soon while I'm doing the book launch, but it's completely transformed. It, oddly enough, a lot of people from the West Coast have moved to Texas, Austin specifically, where I live, to do stand up comedy. Uh, there's wow. kind of a, there's a, um, I can't even think of the word, but a migration of people coming from the West Coast yeah. here. 
I don't know. Does, do Texans laugh easier, Greg? What's what's the deal? <laughs> <laughs> they can actually get on stage. That's the best. That's the best. Oh, that's that's what it is. Sales pitch is you can actually get stage time here. Yeah, I was actually. I guess I was being a bit daft there. I just thought there was a good market of laughter. Laughter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, so I, I mentioned to you, Greg, I, I grew up um, Tuck at Rhode Island, uh, former AAA of the, mm-hmm. the Boston Red Sox. And I think they moved over to Wista, <laughs> Wista, Massachusetts for the mm-hmm. AAA now. But uh, so I grew up going to baseball games, um, almost sounds nostalgic, you know, cheaper working class access, cheaper concessions, you know, senior heroes go up through you know, to, through the minors, things like that. Um, right. So I had that background. I've spent some time in the Midwest and every area of the country I look, I kind of think about it in terms of baseball, um, being in Wisconsin and Minnesota and of course um, uh, the West coast. But what was your, uh, what was your, what was your, what was your, uh, what was your dream related to baseball? I mean, you wanted to be a, I saw in the book, you wanted to be a, you wanted to be a star. What? Yeah. Inside your heart, what what do you want to do when it came to baseball? My biggest dream was to be a, a light hitting second baseman who was an exceptional defender on the Minnesota yeah. Twins. That was my dream. <laughs> From the time I was in eighth grade, I just was obsessed with the Minnesota Twins, the contraction kids. They were on the brink of being contracted, being contracted along with the Montreal Expos and the yeah. Twins came back to relevancy around the same time I started high school and I was like, you know what? I want to be one of those guys. And I would watch those guys in the Metrodome. I mean, did you ever see any games? And did you ever go to the Metrodome? I I did. And, um, you go, I'm going to tell you my Metrodome story after you continue this. Yes. So a Metrodome twins, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, the Metrodome, no matter how much you love the team, the Metrodome is one of the was one of the most depressing places to watch a baseball yes. game. It was so huh, sad. Huh. <laughs> they had the AstroTurf. It's indoors. And I get it. Minnesota April and Minnesota October can be really cold. And so you being indoors is an asset in those months. But when it's 85 degrees and sunny and one of the only warm days of the year in the middle of the summer in Minnesota and you're indoors watching baseball, uh, it <laughs> – it, it does taint this experience a little bit, but I was still obsessed with those guys. Torrey Hunter, Jock Jones, Brad Radke, Corey Kosky, Doug Mankiewicz. I was just obsessed with those Minnesota Twins, and I wanted to be them to the point where I would go down to Fort Myers to watch their – not even their spring training. I would go to watch their spring training pre-workouts. So when pitchers and catchers report um, – this is back before the Minnesota Twins were a sexy team either – and there'd yeah, be right. nobody, nobody would be at workouts but me and a couple of newspaper guys. And I'd watch them and I'd say, I want to be one of those guys. Uh, yeah, I I had um so I I mean this is gonna connect uh, interestingly mm-hmm. enough on the twins Red Sox bit. So this I had two strange experiences uh at a twins game, and you're probably gonna love both of them. Uh, the <laughs> first one is I'm in the stands and Speaking of Doug Mankiewicz, he was at first base for the Twins, mm-hmm. uh, warming up. During the warm up, something happens on the field. Some players are cleared out, and there's some things on the internet. I mean, this is this is a while ago. Some 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 people have cell phones. So you're able to look up maybe a website on your phone. Right. And Nomar Garcia Para had been traded um, and the trade involved must have been Minnesota, Boston, and I think it involved the third team. Minc- uh, Garcia Parra was gone from the hmm. Red Sox, so he never played that game. So like a famous player is like never came into the lineup. And Minkiewicz changed uniforms and played first base for the Red Sox that game. Wow. He's, he During the course in warm-ups, he came out as a twin he started first base for the Red Sox. He was traded during the, that sequence. Um, just a, a wild, a wild piece. The other story was there was a tornado. Speaking, remember you were saying inside during yeah. the Metrodome? There was a tornado in August, and the pressure differential outside of the dome compared to the pressure inside the dome, mm-hmm. when people started to leave um, 
the facility, the um, the glass door smashed to smithereens wow. like, all around the stadium. Yeah. So first of all, I'm like, I'm in this dome watching the Twins who just beat the Red Sox. So that was a good night for you. Mm-hmm. And um, I'm strolling out and the doors are smashing because of the pressure differential. The good, we got nothing but the good old Metrodome, right? <laughs> right, so, right. Um, I had quite the experience uh, over there. And, and now, of course, it's a different kind of feel, as you alluded to, with the Twins, right? Yeah, I mean, they got that new stadium in 2010, first of all. And I had, mo- I had moved since then. I moved away from Minnesota in 2008. And they got that new stadium. And, man, when I went and saw that place for the first time. And I thought about all those years I went as a kid to the Metrodome buying $6 cheap. I mean, they almost literally couldn't give their tickets away at the Metrodome when they were at the mid nineties team when they were right. Good. Right. So I, you know, we'd get $6 seats and dollar hot dogs. It felt like they had dollar hot dogs, like five nights a week with <laughs> <laughs> the target field. When I saw that the first time I just teared up just, I don't know. It was like I had accomplished something, you know, almost as though yeah. I'd, I'd had some part in them building themselves back up to relevance. And now they're back. They're a home run smashing team. And to be quite frank, I don't watch baseball as much as I used to. I allude, I allude that to that a little bit in the book about, you know, my time in the minors as a clubhouse attendant. I, I don't want to have a cynical view of the game, but it did paint my perception of baseball to the point where I definitely don't watch the game the same way. I don't, I don't watch it so much as a fan anymore. I watch it as a guy who used to live in the equipment closet and was down there on the field with the guys. And um, yeah. Yeah. And and Greg, of course, you know, uh, talking about the book uh, clubby um, minor league baseball memoir. um, And and, and let's, 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 let's get into that. Um, it's about a couple of years, uh, where you worked as a clubby. And I think you, it's, it's quite clear from early on that what you're doing is, uh, stripping away the, the gloss of the spectacle of the game, right? Uh, just kind of like there's workers, there's low wages, there's getting by, there's players with dreams and it's life, right? So, right. and, and, and so, you're a writer, yep. Uh, and, and and you appreciate writing and, and and do some work around writing. When you started your baseball dream, was it a was it a baseball dream? Was it a writing dream? Was it a hmm. I want a decent job? And it, what we what we what was what do you think the journey was going to be as you went into what the experiences of what became Clubby the book? I had no idea. I was just living my life after college. I had no idea that this was the genesis of a creative work at all. I was, I graduated with an English degree in 2011 from Winthrop university. My only job experience before graduation was uh, being an equipment manager for the division one Winthrop Eagles. And I was actually at Winthrop on a baseball scholarship for washing jock straps. And that was my only job experience when I graduated. And it was almost like, I fell into professional baseball where I didn't have, I think as an artist, I had a lot, I still do have a lot of insecurities about, am I going to be able to maintain this financially? Am I going to be able to maintain this as far as my sanity goes? Like a full-time artist is a hard thing to maintain. And I definitely didn't have the confidence to dive fully into that out, out of college. Sure. So I've, it's a, it was a fluke timing thing where, a clubhouse attendant job does not normally get listed online. Those get passed down from generation to generation usually. And I just happened to find a listing for this clubhouse clubhouse attendant position with the Aberdeen Ironbirds. And I was like, I love baseball. I'm going to go into this world. And what I discovered was I never wanted this to be an expose. I didn't want this to be a, um, you know, a cynical view of the game. I just wanted to tell a story of what happened and try to tell it as truthfully as possible. And what I found was some unsavory truths in minor league baseball. Yeah. And, and, and I, you know, I, I know money and getting by and, and, and just the intensity of that from day to day and the, yeah. 
the long haul of the baseball season. I mean, everybody talks about how long this, this season, I mean, typical circumstances, we're talking about baseball in a pandemic where we just probably just, you know, want it to occur in general or, you oh, know, yeah. like, uh, you know, in some, some way that we understand it. But, um, uh, when you, when you, when you start to have, uh, the experience of being, you know, close to the game and you kind of happen, uh, uh, upon it, um, you 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 get into this a lot during the book as far as feeling part of the team or mm -hmm. connecting to experiences that make you feel like you know you're helping the players with you know get by or what was that piece like i mean did you do you feel at the end of the day that you took it really seriously and you know wanted to be part of the team and part of that you know fabric and connection mm -hmm. is, is is that what happened or did you kind of feel alienated from that you know with your role. Yeah. It's a hard line. I, there's a big part of me at the time. I, I didn't want to care about it as much as I did. You know, I want, I wanted to be more, you know, this book is a reflection of how I saw the world at that time. And I think at the time I wanted to be distanced, but I also, it, it was like the little, like I said, I was the youngest of five boys and I felt like I was in a clubhouse full of older brothers, even though these guys were the same age as me. And I desperately wanted their approval, the players, the coaches, yeah, whomever, yeah. without letting them know that I wanted their approval. And while at the same time, I had a position of, you know, in some ways, significant power, like I held some, when it comes to baseball, the little stuff matters a lot, like food and equipment is a huge commodity some guys don't care about what happens in the game all they care about is the post game spread and that was my duty um and i would hear Making secrets that right. yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean I, I would hear about transactions before other guys i would hear conversations in the coach's office about who was going to get fired and who was going to get moved up and i would i don't know I feel like I would wield that information to try and gain some sort of status in the clubhouse. But looking back on it now, I think it's real obvious that I wanted so badly to be a part of the team that um, I just wasn't willing to admit it to myself at the time, even to the point where when I wrote the first draft, this is my college th or my graduate school thesis, Clubia's. And when I was workshopping it in grad school, I was writing it as though it was an expose. So I was, it was a completely journalistic view uh research heavy not my i wasn't a character in it whatsoever i was trying to be completely a, a face narrator and one of my best friends in the workshop she said it's shocking how much this person wants to be a part of this world and they're not allowing themselves to be a character in it and we're talking about me and just it, feeling the tension just feeling the tension in the story huh probably around that or the exactly narrative. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And she was, you know, she's one of my closest friends and she had that insight to know me as a person as well. And, um, as the author. And once I realized that I was the main character of this story, it completely opened up what I was, what I was able and willing to explore narratively, including like these uncomfortable little brother feelings that I as a clubhouse attendant. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot of that. I, I mean, there's a lot of psychology in life, uh, in the book and everybody was talking with Greg Larson, uh, new book, uh, clubby coming out, uh, April, April one, right, right in time for, or right around the time we get the uh, first pitch in baseball. Mm -hmm. Um, Greg, what, what is it about baseball that attracts writers and thinkers? I, I mentioned this question here. Like what, what is it about good old baseball yeah. and i know you i know you did it in the book too right because you're mm -hmm. thinking about life you got relationships what am i doing on this planet what right. what is it about baseball that that, that pr proves to be pretty darn fertile ground for that question i think more than anything it's a byproduct of the fact that the game moves slower than other popular games i think baseball is a game of absence more than it is it's a game of nothing more than it is a game of something you know the absence of a clock a baseball game in theory could start today and last until the end of mankind um it would just keep right. going on and on i mean <laughs> yeah and you know about that with the pawtucket red Sox, the 33 inning game longest game in baseball is <laughs> right yeah, yeah, yeah i know that more than anybody <laughs> yeah. um well, somebody once mentioned to me, I'm going to ask you to explain a little bit more of mm -hmm. writer's connection to, to baseball, but 
a friend of mine, uh, a good friend of mine, Eddie, said to me, isn't it strange in baseball how the defense controls the ball? Right. And he said, name, name another sport like that. And I'm like, whoa, man. <laughs> the defense right. controls the ball. Um, but uh, letting let you go on a bit more about uh, writers and, 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 and baseball and the, the big theme. You're saying there's space for it, you think. Space, space. to think in baseball. Yeah. And yes, that is an interesting word too, because space is a huge theme in this book. And I think that's tied into it. Like baseball is so tied to nostalgia and it's so tied to childhood and it's so tied to our relationships with our parents and our relationships with our community that I think we project this cosmic level of perfection onto the game that goes all the way down to you know, 60 feet and six inches from home plate to pitcher's mound, 90 feet between base paths. And I think we, I don't know, we pro- the same way we project a sort of perfection onto our childhood at times, I think we project that same level of perfection onto the game of baseball. And that just naturally lends itself to poetic contemplation. And then the fact that the game is so spacious, that it is so literally timeless there's no clocks in the game allows us to sit down and think deeply about it and i think those factors all attract writers yeah thank you so much for your thoughts on that i mean there's a there's a lot there and i and actually agree in in approach of why some of those um you know some of those conditions might might be there for it and um you know i like listened uh, well reading uh you, you know your writing and you do a great job that i one of the things that i connected to personally uh was a, a that sense of place or like what the concessions smelled like it felt like or what the Right. Kind of run down in this industrial area you were driving, you know, like whatever the conditions were, I could really feel them in a lot of those small mm-hmm. baseball towns. You did a good job conveying. I could hear the, I could hear the racket and, and feel the place. Was that um, something you were really trying to 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 get at? Maybe the the grittiness of minor league baseball. Interesting. I had never thought of it in that way. You know, those kinds of things they happened on a subconscious level creatively, you know, like if I think of a detail, like this smell of the cinnamon pecans dancing around the concourse and I think of it in the writing process, I try to trust my instincts without thinking, oh, I'm trying to convey a sense of play or I'm trying to convince, convey a sense of grittiness. I just try to trust that instinct more than anything. I just want to create scenes. Uh, you know, I think about a book like this, like a movie. I mean, people have been telling me that they have been binge reading it. People tell me that it's, it puts you right there in the clubhouse and in the stadium. And I think that's a byproduct of my, my writing process where I think about it, like I'm painting a picture. I think about it like I'm filming a movie scene and I try not to think about like the, the what I, I try not to think about what it is that it's conveying. I just try to paint as accurate a picture as I possibly can. Yeah, I uh, and 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 I appreciate that too. And I I I, I liked, or I guess I could uh, connect with uh, your your use of dialogue. And I think people mm. who read, will be reading the book and, and know the book or have an advanced you know knowledge of it connect with kind of the banter and the dialogue as you do it. I think that's why they see it in a cinematic forms. And of course, you know, what we're talking about is the iron birds here. We're talking about, you know, for baseball folks and even outside of baseball, you know, Cal Ripken, yes. the Baltimore Orioles, you know, the, the mid Atlantic. I mean, you can connect with a lot of those, um, you know, a lot of those pieces, but I, here's a question I wanted to ask you, Greg. Sure. And of course I know that you, uh, your press and uh, Brad Belukshin, a former guest, something rather than nothing, uh, university of Nebraska uh, press putting out some nice, nice books here, obviously Brad's book is, is, is fascinating and it's fascinating for very, very different reasons than yours. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, he uh, interviews uh, a variety, you know, 11, 12 baseball players from a, a randomized, pack system right a randomized pack right. and these are guys who went through the game they're out of the game some of them don't want to talk about the game most of them want to talk about the game or 
where the good wings are or how golfing's going, right? It's after, it's after, after hmm. the game, Wax Pack, and you're, you get the, the minor league memoir. Um, did you, did you make, did you make any connections about some of the stuff you ran into and maybe some of the, so, some of the, the problematic pieces of minor league baseball? Did you connect to some of those themes to, the story with the bookend being uh Baluchian with players yeah. after their career. Oh, absolutely. Especially with the coaching staff at the low minor league level, particularly on the Ironbirds, a lot of the coaches were former major leaguers. And, you know, in minor league baseball, an organization will have what's called roving coaches that are roving around from one, they're not associated with any particular minor league team. They just coach the entire minor league system for the Orioles in this case. And they just rove around from team to team. And a lot of those examples, Al Bumbry uh, example in the book was Al Bumbry, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, And those guys, those guys are very similar. I I saw a lot of similarities between those guys and the guys that Brad interviewed. And a lot of them stayed with it because they loved baseball. Absolutely. But a lot of them, I believe stayed with it. They stayed in the game after they had retired because they had no other choice. And maybe for similar reasons as why I got into baseball, because that was the only job experience I had. And I just wonder, I don't know if I could put, I don't know if I could put a percentage on it, but I I just wonder what percentage of those guys are really recapturing, trying to recapture some past glory. If they just think of it as like, this is a cool summer job to continue as I, I'm in my post-playing days, maybe I still get a pension from Major League Baseball. Uh, and I wonder how many of them are willing to be honest with themselves about what the true answer to that question is. Yeah. I, um, uh, Gary Allenson, right? Uh, yes. In, in, in the book. Um, I connected with that as well. In 1978, Gary Allenson was the MVP of the International League. For the Pawtucket Red Sox. And um, I remember him. He was supposed to come up in uh, after Carlton Fisk, who is a character in Brad Belushian's book, the one he couldn't get to talk to, <laughs> Carlton Fisk. Right. I, 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 huh. Gary, I mean, you reached out to me. Our story, once we put it together, it makes <laughs> it tells the rest <laughs> of everything. No, but Gary Allison, I didn't know this. I remember... I remember, you know, I'm going to all the Pawtucket Red Sox uh, huh. games and in Carlton Fisk, of course, you know, he leaves the Red Sox. Now, whoever is a catcher in the minor league system is going to be um, a very, you know, somebody's going to be scrutinized. And yeah, Gary Allenson was the 1978 MVP for Triple A International League for the um, for the Pawtucket Red Sox. And he's also was was he the co- coach uh, manager with the Aberdeen? Yeah, he was the coach for 2012. It? And, uh, yeah, he also showed up in Brad's book. Gary Allenson has been around the block quite a bit. He shows up in, in different places, including in clubby, including in the wax back and including apparently the, uh, international league MVP ceremony. I had no idea. That's no joke. Winning the MVP of triple A is no joke. Well, that's no joke. Yeah. It was 1978. He had 20 bombs, 78, 78 RBIs. He had a, he had a big bop in year in 78. Mm-hmm. Stern guy. He was a he's a hell of a character, but he would everything he did was on a line. He was short, like very much catcher's stature, but he had these really intimidating blue eyes, and he would just stare you down and he marched everywhere like a drill sergeant. I was terrified of that guy. Love he was adorable too at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I loved uh, I loved uh, you know c- c- seeing some of the some of the, the the characters. I think what's interesting about your book is that you do open up and not in an exposing type of way or not an exploitative type of way, but just how a system is going to work. That hmm. there's a major league club that kind of runs the shots. Their interests are more important than everybody. And just hearing about in a big system when it comes to players, travel, rehab assignments how it all works, you know, how, how, you know, uh, through the different levels, um, a minor league system works. And I believe there's a, a larger minor league shakeup going on, I think, because oh, of yes. economic affiliation. Yeah. Hey, do you know anything about that? You want to mention anything just in general about what, what you see going on with the minor leagues as we, you know, as baseball moves ahead? Oh, for sure. I mean, I, 
what I'm seeing in the minor league system is a bunch of uh, about 40 teams are being taken. They've lost affiliation with the major leagues, meaning that they're no longer associated with any major league team. And that means they probably just won't exist anymore. I frankly think it's a good thing. I think major league baseball was trying to take care of too many children, so to speak. And a lot of their house wasn't in order facility. Now granted Ripken stadium where the iron birds play and where I was posted, that is a gorgeous stadium. Uh, it's yeah. quite an anomaly for that level, though. There are plenty of stadiums at that level that just aren't equipped to take care of future major leaguers. And players are getting paid more, which I think is important. It's still not a lot. They got, you know, they get, for example, $500 a week instead of $290 a week, for example, in single A. I think they're good changes. They're going to be painful for towns that are losing their teams, but in time, it'll in a couple of years, people will forget <laughs> just like anything else. Yeah. Um, tell us about, tell about, uh, I, I was interested in given the, the unique uh, point where you are, um, you know, you're promoting uh, this book and of course, you know, things uh, obviously change uh, with the pandemic and your ability mm. to connect and, and, and get this um, and get this out there. What's the experience as you're looking to, um, you know, with with the book release tied uh, tied to baseball? Um, is this a very, you know, ho- you know, hopeful, exciting uh, experience for you as you know, this this is your book. This this baby is yeah. coming out this spring. So what's going on with that? <laughs> I- I'm doing everything I possibly can to get the word out. I'm. I'm doing podcasts. I'm doing interviews with newspapers. I'm open to live events. Ideally, I think it would be great to go into minor league stadiums and do book signings there and maybe even do readings. I don't know how realistic that's going to be over the summer. I don't know you know, how open or safe that's going to be. But right now, I'm just at a point where I'm trying to get it in the hands of as many people in minor league clubhouses and as many fans um, as possible. Like, that's all I care about right now is just sharing this story with as many people as possible. Yeah, we got some uh, baseball out where I am. Uh, baseball's, you know, as, as, as you know, I uh, mentioned I'm from the East Coast, sometime mm-hmm. in the Midwest. But um, out here, I'm, I'm fascinated by West Coast uh, baseball culture because in California, it's different than Oregon. On the western side of Oregon, it rains too much. But on the uh the the eastern side baseball is pretty darn big in this in the high desert down hmm. south like like uh, Klamath Falls, and of course the Oregon State uh, the Beavers have won the um, uh, national championship uh, before, and uh, Jacoby Ellsbury uh, played for the Red Sox, and the Yankees came out of uh, Madras, Oregon. There's uh, Salem Kaiser Volcanoes. I think they're a single A. Yeah. Uh, for the Giants. So yeah, even just driving around right here. Yeah. As part of the culture and in, in these small towns, but this realignment and in, in this, this change is certainly going to be something that we see, you know, uh, sh- uh, shake out or something that, that you expect, um, haven't seen what's going on. And I just read some of the news recently about how affiliations, there's going to be a, a pretty much a pretty darn noticeable realignment is the best way oh, to yeah. sum it up. What do you say? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what I wanted to know is, uh, about your process in, in creating this book, this Mm -hmm. novel, right? As you know, the podcast gets into the, the, the creative process. Writers have it hard. It's not easy to write a book. It's not easy to get it done, get it reviewed, get it edited, get it promoted, get into people's hands. Mm -hmm. So you, so you're connected with that right now. Oh yeah. What is the process for you? in creation and in creating this book, what was it like for you to say, Hey, this is the story as I have it. And you talk to folks, they say, you got to put yourself as a character in there and you put yourself as a character in there. Mm -hmm. And now you've got this, this, this piece of art. It's yours. You created it. Mm -hmm. How do you feel? What's that like? It feels up until the point. It's just a manuscript at first. It's a file on my computer. And it, it feels like a, a process of insanity because it's such a, me writing this book was such an, you know, it is such an insular process. I'm sitting in a library in Old Dominion University in Norfolk, Virginia on Saturday afternoon trying to type my 2000 words for the day. And I'm on words 33,527 of an eventual 97,000 word first draft. And I'm wondering 
why am I wasting my time with it? Nobody's going to care about this. This is self-indulgent. All that self-loathing. Yeah, stuff. yeah. <laughs> why, why, why? Right. Yeah. I, I don't know if that's a necessary part of the creative process. It seems to drive me. I think my therapist would be happier if I actually got rid of that self-loathing <laughs> inner monologue. But that it just seems like an exercise in insanity for so long. I had the finished manuscript, sent it out to editors and publish editors and publishers and agents, got rejected from more than a hundred over the course of a couple of years, gave up on the book. I started going into ghostwriting actually. And so like I was given my creative juice for about two years. I was given my creative juice to other people's books. Sure. And Clubby, I thought was just something fun that I tried in grad school and I thought it might never see the world. And then, I don't know, it was summer 2019 and I decided to give it another shot. I don't remember exactly what triggered me to get back into it, but I sent out another 100 plus. I got rejected from 221 agents, editors, and publishers, including the University of Nebraska Press. They, My eventual publisher, they rejected me the first time I queried them. Uh, I cut out about 20,000 words, a lot of really deep um, research heavy backstory that just bogged down the story. You know, you, you even, I have to correct you on one thing, Ken, and I'm, it's a flattering, it's a flattering choice, but you keep referring to it as a novel. And I think that's a beautiful way to describe it, but a novel is necessarily fiction and yeah, right. as a memoir is nonfiction, but I tried to write it with the same tenants, characters, scene, dialogue, plot, as a good novel. So the fact that you refer to it as a novel is like the greatest compliment that I could get. Like people telling me that it's a binge worthy book is incredible. I was so scared. I thought nobody's going to care about this book. Look at all of these agents and publishers who are rejecting it. Why would any readers care about it? And now I'm starting to get the early feedback and it's like, wow, I feel like a punk rock badass for going against all of these people who said I couldn't do it. And now here we are and people are enjoying it. Well, and, and I appreciate your comments and I too. Yeah. And that, that actually, well, yeah, that actually was a slip because uh, the, the way that, uh, having read it, it hangs on my head as, as uh, in, in novelistic form. Right. Yes. So, uh, but, but one of the, one of the things you said there, and I think, you know, within the podcast, um, I mean, heading towards 80, uh, episodes on the podcast. And I, as you know, I talk to, um, you know, uh, writers and, and sculptors, uh, painters, uh, musicians, etc. And it, it is really, uh, just, a unimaginable process of acceptance, rejection. Where do I fit in? Is it worthy? Does this speak to anybody? Does it only speak to me? And it's such a difficult process. You know, it's commonly referred to as, you know, the, you know, imposter syndrome or yes. am I the person who's supposed to create, aren't other spe people supposed to write baseball books and, right. and things like that. So, right. um, you know, I've always felt, I, I think there's differences between the arts and I've always had a, a soft heart for the, uh, having writing shorter writings myself mm -hmm. i think writing is so magnificently difficult that mm -hmm. i always kind of am a bit more into how do you see it through right because it's such a long process um it is i mean it literally feels like it, it feels like something that only a crazy person would do and because it's you're so by your you can get so stuck in your own head you know like do you ever feel that way when you're writing something where you're you're so in your own head you just wonder why do it at all? Yeah. Yeah. That's the kind of fundamental question behind it. So, uh, Greg, something rather than nothing. Yep. Is, it, 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 I'm asking you both, why is there something rather than nothing? But it, in baseball, and I know you talked about this, something and nothing, the space in this in the game, is baseball a game? Uh, is, is, is there a lot of something there? Or is there a lot of nothing there? A lot of nothing. I think a lot more nothing than something. And that's what makes it beautiful is the absences, the absences of the clock, the absences of, you, you know, most sports like basketball, hockey, football, they have a uniform size of a field. Baseball, you go to any different stadium, they have a different outfield fence. It just, each one has its own personality. So there's an absence of 
structure in a certain way. Yeah. I, I think there's so much space in the game that that's what makes it beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, before I connect, uh, the, the, we connect the listeners here, how to, you know, make sure they, uh, you know, they get that book and learn some, some more info about the book. I had another kind of bigger question, um, mm-hmm. for you about, about the experiences that you relay, uh, in the book, in the memoir. Did you struggle a whole bunch with as far as what to tell, right? I mean, because it's a screwy mm. story, right? I mean, you're in the minor leagues, you're sleeping in the, you're, speak, you're sleeping in the clubhouse, you got relationship issues, you got, you know, you're trying to get money in your pocket, you have a little more than others, you go through conundrums of, should they have more, should I have less? <laughs> like, right. In, in ex- telling the personal components of that personal story, yes. How did that feel for you to 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 get into all that stuff? Yeah, that's the question with the memoir, isn't it? Like when I write when I wrote the first draft, I had to think about it solely as I had to almost think about it like a sociopath. Like these aren't people, these are characters. I'll think about them as people in this in the edits. And otherwise that that question can be crippling for a nonfiction writer of, oh, am I exposing too much? Is this gonna be embarrassing for me? Is somebody sure. going to sue me for this? All of those questions can completely choke a nonfiction project. And I, I've seen it happen um, with some of my fellow classmates in grad school. And I just thought, you know what? I'm just going to tell everything like the way I see it. And I'm still nervous to send this copy to characters. You know, Alan Mills is the pitching coach on the Iron Birds in this book. And he's still in baseball. And I was nervous to send him a copy. He felt like he was the villain in the book. And I thought, no way, you're not the villain. You're my foil, if anything. We exaggerate each other, but you're not the villain. You're one of my favorite characters. But Yeah, so going through that that, that process and... um... No, and I, I wanted to I wanted to thank you for it because I believe there's a very uh, human element, and I think getting into you know, so I I'm a labor guy, right? I work for I work for a union, so mm-hmm. I was thinking about the terms of you know when we think about wages, or we think everybody's a superstar, or we think that everybody has it made. A lot of times we're not taking proper attention to say, hey, do we know what's going on? You know, right? Is it is it like it seems? And I think like anything else in life, baseball is not everything that it looks like. Um, and you know, I know from your comments, as far as your connection to the story that you're going, still moving through that and figuring out what it all means for you as a fan, Mm -hmm. as a viewer, right? A hundred percent. I have a very complicated relationship with baseball and having this book out in the world only complicated. It's more complicates it more, but it's also, it's also an opportunity for me to understand like yeah, what is my relationship to the game? What is my relationship to seeing those guys not making all of that make not making enough money? The guilt associated with it. It's um Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and uh well again uh it it's just it's a it's we got I got beautiful weather out here in Oregon and 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 the book clubby and talking to you and, and baseball I think it's a year to year thing that we think about but prior to letting you go Greg mm-hmm. um can you let can you let the listeners know how to connect to the book I know you got a website for it or or yep. also if you want um people to kind of connect you connect to you directly distribution I don't know any of that stuff it's your time Absolutely. Uh, the easiest way to connect with me to pre-order the book to get extra content is on clubbybook.com. That's C-L-U-B-B-I-E book.com. And I'll have access to uh, social media. Everything else that you want to associate with Clubby is found there. Easy enough, right? Yes, sir. All right. Um, Greg, uh Thank you so much for uh, joining something rather than nothing. Um, I know that um, there's even more to talk about, and I think uh, it might be kind of fun as we get into the baseball season. The book gets out there. Maybe we can check back in during the you know during the summer and uh, just just see how things are developing and using the baseball season as kind of the connective tissue here. So I would love <laughs> thank to. <you. laughs> All right. Thank you for uh, having me. Absolutely. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, Greg Larson, uh, author of, of Clubby. Uh, great time with you, Greg, and uh, great success with the book. We'll talk soon, all right? Thank you, sir. Take care.
This is something rather than nothing.